Seekers, that was Flying Saucer's Attack by the Rosillos. And special thanks to Steve from North Carolina who sent me the tracks to work on. He said, if you want to do any more bass covers, just send me the song you want to do and I'll make you a track without bass on it and you can use that as your, as your uh, backing track. And he did, and that's great. So thank you, Steve. So I, uh, before I get to the question of the day that I want to address, I want to read you something. Yesterday I put up a blog, not a blog, a vlog, a video about Buddhist views on abortion. And I don't want to belabor that topic because it's getting belabored enough in the media. But I was looking up uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj's talks about birth. And this is not the quote I wanted to come up with, but this is the quote I came up with and I thought I'd read it to you. This is Nisargadatta Maharaj, and so he says, How true can the experience be that comes through breathing? So breathing is the, the vital breath. That's their philosophy that there's a, um, that what you are is the vital breath. Had you seen the world before you were born? The world is born along with you. The I amness in the human body is the birthplace of the world. When consciousness arises, only then the world is born. There is no birth or death for you. Consciousness has not created an individual, but the whole world. Body consciousness is the obstruction. Otherwise, it is easy to understand this. Body consciousness has delivered the perfect one into the hands of time or death. And so the, apparently the translator didn't know which one to go with. It has measured it by counting its days. You as the Sadguru self, the true self, have never been born. Okay, So there you go uh, when we're arguing about when life starts at birth or uh, at the conception or all that. There are very, very different ways to conceive of this argument. I think that I'll just leave it at that. And I think that quote goes to show you. Now, here's one of my FAQs, and I kind of don't know always how to answer this one, but here we go. Let me just start. I don't want to give you all the caveats first. Hey Brad, could you speak about the notion of feeling energy, chi in parentheses, during zazen? Does zen have a tradition or discuss it? And the short answer is no. Uh, it's, it's something that comes up a lot. A lot of people ask this question because I think for us in the West, all of the philosophies of the East are squeezed together into one. And so when we hear about chi energy and all this stuff, we kind of think, oh, the Buddhists must have something to say about that. And they don't really have much. Now, I spent some time this morning looking up the word energy and related words like that in Dogen's Shobo Genzo. And because I'm moving house, all of my paper copies of Shobo Genzo are packed away in boxes, so I had to do this. Well, it's easier to search for a word in the PDF, but it's easier to come out here and read it on a video from paper. But I had to had to do everything by putting it in screenshots and, and then uh, looking at it on my phone. So uh, here goes. Here's a few instances. One of them is a phrase, Dozeikon, which I mentioned in an earlier video. It means to play with uh, the soul. And it's a phrase that Dogen often uses for Zazen. And here is a footnote by Nishijima Roshi and Mike Cross about that phrase, play with the soul. So the first word, ro, means to play or toy with. It suggests easy control and enjoyment. Say means spirit, energy, vitality. So say might be the kind of energy we're talking about, but it is not, it is not the uh, character chi. Uh, kon uh, means soul, spirit, or ghost, but the phrase tamashi o ieru, which is the same, uh, kon is also pronounced tamashi because Japanese is confusing, uh, literally to put soul into means to give life to, to animate, to breathe life into. And for the compound seikon, uh, span and hadamadzitsuki, I don't know, it must be a, a dictionary, uh, gives 
energy or vitality, Nelson gives the phrase seikon as to lose one energy, lose one's energy. Thus, seikon means the soul as the animating principle or actuating cause of an individual life, a person's total self. That is something vital, energetic, and whole rather than something ethereal. So that's uh, that's confusing, but that's a, a use of energy in Dogen's work. Uh, one quote, though, that I liked uh, goes like this, and this is from a chapter in Dogen, I think it's Gabio, I think, which is a painted rice cake. Yes, it is Gabio. It's painted rice cake. It's chapter 40 in Shobogenzo. I thought I wouldn't remember that. <laughs> but uh, here's the, the quote. My late master, that's Tendo Nyojo, Dogen's teacher, said, the long bamboos and the banana plants have entered a picture. So this is going to be one of those weird ancient oriental sounding phrases. Sorry to use that weird word oriental. But this is one that throws a lot of people off, but bear with me. I'm going to read it to you and see if I can explain it. This expression, this is Dogen talking, this, is a, this expression is an expression in which a person who has transcended long and short is, in every instance, experiencing the study of painting a picture. So the phrase in question is, a painted picture does not satisfy hunger. And Dogen, in his typical contrarian way, says a painted picture sometimes does satisfy hunger. And he's talking about the intellectual aspect of Zen practice and the physical aspect. And Dogen, as I've said before, was a person who valued both. So that's the basic thing of this, of this chapter. But here's what he says about energy. The long bamboos means long stem bamboos. He's just translating Chinese into Japanese. They are the workings of yin and yang. Now, those are the two opposing forms of energy in Taoist philosophy, and that's and the qi energy, and that is what the questioner is asking about. And at the same time, they make yin and yang work, wherein they experience years and months as the long bamboos. Those years and months of yin and yang are unfathomable. The great saints glimpse yin and yang, but the great saints cannot fathom yin and yang. Because yin and yang together is the dharma in equilibrium, fathoming in equilibrium, and the state of truth in equilibrium, it is beyond the yin and the yang which concern the minds and eyes of non-Buddhists and the two vehicles today. It is the yin and yang of the long bamboos, it is the steps in the history of the long bamboos, it is the world of the long bamboos. Now, Nishijima Roshi doesn't really explain what this long bamboos means, but I think the long bamboos are just a symbol of real things in the real world. And what he seems to be saying is, don't worry too much about yin and yang. He says, it is beyond the yin and the yang which concern the minds and eyes of non-Buddhists and the two vehicles today. So what I, I think that means is that he's saying it's, it's not really real yin and yang, real energy is beyond the kind of stuff that people discuss as energy in outside of Buddhism. The only place I've come across energy being discussed in Buddhism was a conversation I had with my first teacher uh, and it went something like this. I was reading a lot of different books at the time of you know different spiritual traditions from the Far East and I'd come across some stuff about Kundalini and I said what do you think about Kundalini? And he said, well, Kundalini seems to me to be an effort to take all of the energy of the body and the, the mind and force them into the head. And I don't remember the rest of the conversation, but I thought, oh, yeah, it does kind of seem like that because it's about, you know, drawing your energy up and up and up to the, to the top chakra. And then I don't know what you're supposed to do with it then. And I thought, well that doesn't sound like what I want to do. And the other thing that he said, kind of unrelated to this, is about the cosmic mudra. Let me show you the cosmic mudra. That is this position that we put our hands in when we're doing zazen. And I asked him once, what's that cosmic mudra about? And he said, it's, it's a way to make the energy in the body flow all around evenly throughout the body. So 
that's about all you're gonna get in the Zen tradition. You really won't get a lot of discussion about qi energy. I mean, you might, there might be some Zen teachers who are into reading Taoism and then they talk about qi energy, but for the most part, we don't talk about qi energy. Uh, there are people sometimes who will say to me, to other teachers, that when they do Zazen practice, they feel this, this energy or that energy. My own experience with that is I never really had a, a feeling of, you know, energy. And I think a lot of this is just if you have a kind of a, a mind or imagination which likes to see things in terms of energy, you're going you're gonna to feel this and that and you're going to say, oh, the energy is flowing. And I'm not saying it's completely imaginary, but it's just a way of, of framing it mentally, what's going on in your body. And I guess I never framed it that way, so I never cared too much about the energy in my body. If anything, if anything I'm trying to do with energy is trying to make it flow evenly. But it's not something I ever really talked about or got concerned about. And it's, it's something that really is mostly absent from the tradition as far as I have seen. Like I say, there might be some teachers who are into that as a kind of sideline or something, the way I'm into Nisargadatta Maharaj or something as a sideline but it's really not part of, of the Zen tradition to talk about energy or to worry about trying to manipulate energy or, or, or to do any of that. Um, you know, I had a friend who got into Tai Chi and she did an energy thing on me one time. This was like 10 or more years ago. And I was game to do it, but I came away feeling like I didn't really feel anything. <laughs> so... You know, I'm sorry that for that non-answer, but maybe it is an answer, that this this subject doesn't get a lot of discussion in the Zen tradition. So the, the short answer is no, there isn't much talk about that stuff. So there you go. There's a non-answer, and I hope that helped. And I'm sorry, you know, I'm moving house, as I said, and, and I haven't got a lot of uh, time to put a lot of effort into these videos right now. And I promise that once I'm moved, I'll, uh, I'll make some videos where I'm going to do more deep dives into things. But if you want to support my move and everything else that I'm doing in my life, uh, go to the URL you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen dot info slash donate there you will find links to my paypal and patreon accounts those are my main and usually only ways of making a living so i appreciate it and i especially appreciate it right now because this move is costing loads of money so uh but but uh as i always say you don't got to donate if you don't want to donate because this is offered for free so so whatever if you feel like donating go ahead also if you want to make another kind of donation to me, buy my new book. It's out now. People are telling me that their orders from Amazon are showing up, and uh, I've seen it in at least one bookstore. So go support your local bookstores, see if they have it. Uh, it's called The Other Side of Nothing, and it's really good. And it was number one in karma Buddhism. I don't know what that means, but that was uh, one of Amazon's categories, and it was number one the other day. I don't know if it's still number one. Somebody told me it was number one in Buddhism all overall when that person looked at it, so we'll see. I think it's pretty good. So go buy that, make it sell a million copies, and uh, that's great. And we'll see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. Hey, Ziggy Rug. Ziggy, you look like a rug. Ziggy, you look like a rug. I always like it when he does that little pose, the rug pose. He looks like a little bear rug. Hey, Ziggy, Ziggy, give the people a shot of your face there. Okay. Talk to you later, Ziggy. Bye.